Hi everyone, welcome to the second uh, series of the Just Discussion series, uh, Just in Discussion. Today I have with me uh, one of the uh, Just Exco members, his name is uh, uh, Dr. Khaldun Mali. And today we will be talking about the topic of geopolitical ethics in the 21st century, a need for a new shared global ethic. And the topic mainly revolves around the question of uh, as the world presses into the 21st century, we talk a lot about technological and economical advancements, which have grown remarkably within the past few centuries. But uh, when it comes to issues of spirituality, morality, ethics, and politics, it is arguable that we have not seen the same kind of innovation. And to discuss this topic, I would like to uh, ask uh, Kaldun Malik over here to introduce himself and uh, give a bit of your background for everyone. Hi, Sanal. Thank you so much for having me. Um, my name is Khaldun, uh, Khaldun Malik, and I, uh, I teach um, history at uh, University of Kebangsaan Malaysia, the National University of Malaysia, at the Institute of Ethnic Studies. And um, I, I'm essentially an in intellectual historian. So I, 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 my, a main part of my research is on, um, on, is on the history of ideas. So, yes, so that's essentially the blurb about me, but yes, <laughs> you go. Yep, so now we have a few guidelines on how to frame the topic, but I just wanted to get your insights on to the uh, discussion of the matter, because when we talk about morality, when we talk about our sense of what is moral, right or wrong, and how, what informs us and how we conceive things uh, from a moral perspective, these things inform us about uh, issues such as laws, but also above all of it talks about issues of justice and how we envision ourselves as the human species going forward. But um, as some people would argue, um, the problem with this sort of paradigm thinking is that it divides us into a large extent. Uh, our morality is divided largely to a civilizational extent where a lot of how we conceive right and wrong is determined by our moral standing in each of our civilizations and our cultures. Um, in that sense, a lot of us tend to take the position where these things are taking positions. But do these um, approach to morality uh, essentially just result in active polarization of morality? What do you think? Because this influences things like how we negotiate politics between uh, each other's countries, each other's right. cultures. Yeah. Mm. Sure. Thank you. Thanks for that. Um, well, wow. That's a, that's a whole host of very, as far as I understand it, complex issues that mm -hmm. uh, you've, um, you've put forward. Um, it's, um, it, it's, it, it's a bit difficult because I'm, in, in a sense, um, as you describe, the problem, one of the, one of the key issues about, about ethical viewpoints is that there's so many of them, so many different ones coming from so many different perspectives, and um, even in a, you know, as a as a as a as a teacher of mine once said, if you get people who, on the surface, seems to agree on, say, a particular understanding of justice, when it comes to defining what it might mean in more concrete terms, they seldom agree. Mm -hmm. so the joke being that. If you get 10 moral philosophers in the room, you'll get 10 very different points of views. Mm, yeah. What I'm trying to make is that even, even in, in any social context, finding common ground about things which would constitute a collective ethical or moral viewpoint is going to be quite difficult. It's mm. not going to be an easy process. That's, that's assuming that... Um, no, that, and I and I'm I'm mentioning that in a very in a very limited context, even in in say in a given society, or even in a given strata of a given society, mm. already have some of these problems. So as you can imagine, once you start expanding the discourse into something much broader, say across a whole nation, uh, mm. across different nations, and across different continents, when you're talking from a globalized perspective. Mm. It, can be quite challenging. Now, this is this is of course not to say that um, 
we can't have shared values. Mm. Now, shared values is quite different from uh, having a, a universalizable ethic. Mm -hmm. And I'll and I'll and I'll tell you the difference. Yeah. Um, one of the one of the key things that I'm sure you know about um, the whole European Enlightenment experience was to create a universalizable template of understanding the world in which we live in and our place in it. Mm -hmm. And the key issue with modern rationality, which underwrites this whole entire project, is that it cuts across uh, the whole idea of prejudice, traditions, and so on and so forth, which philosophers in the late 18th and 19th century thought proved to be uh, a barrier for creating the kind of uh, universalizable understandings that we need in order to progress throughout the modern age. Um, the problem with this, uh, Hassanal, is that um, it is precisely that, because even the idea of a, of a global ethic in that sense, of a global, global possible moral philosophy, mm. is much tied to that very Eurocentric vision. Mm, okay. and the writing it, in reality, is also a whole host of positions which could so easily be seen as partial the whole colonial enterprise. One mm. of the reasons why empire spread, aside from the pursuit of, of wealth and power, is because there is a certain sense of um, either the spread of, uh, you know, uh, Christianity or a universalized, universalizable philosophy. Mm. That is certainly uh, part of the kind of narratives of progress you find implicit within the colonial enterprise throughout the 19th and 20th centuries across the world. Mm. That bringing a civilizing mission with us. We're, we're, we're transforming societies that we encounter. Of course, the reality is much more complex. The reality also has um, elements in it which are extremely nefarious, uh, diabolical mm -hmm. elements. But the whole idea that you're spreading, you're civilizing the world was equally as much a part, at the very least, even, even one wants to dismiss it as being something skin deep or superficial, part of that narrative. Mm -hmm. So in that regard, when you talk about uh, okay, a lot of Eurocentricization of Eurocentricization of civilization, when it comes to the issue of the morality of it, when it comes to the issue of actually um, how we actually determine what is right, what is wrong, even in the sense of international law as well, when it comes to determining these things, it's some would argue that you know is global politics then said to be just essentially a contestation of just who has the most power, who has the most guns, who has the most uh, weapons, because some see it still as a, essentially a moral dead zone where meaningful discussions are pretty much just given at still face value and still given at um, things like uh, just a lip service on the matter. And it's forever framed within those civilizational context because a lot of people now recognize that the, the colonial power, the colonial history that has been given, has been set forth from our colonial eras are pretty much what determined our discourse on how we understand things like right and wrong and so on and so forth. Whereas we also still want to maintain that level of sovereignty as well about how we identify our own sense of laws and right and wrong. Um, which is why also there's like things like if you talk about how U.S. envisions democracy, yeah. how the West envisions democracy, versus how China envisions its own sense of um, it's path to development. If you want to put it that way, yes, exactly. Uh, it's party one is government, and the other one is also because they're trying to negotiate with their own history. Like for example, in the sense of China, everyone uses the issues of things like the um, LGBT issues, it, it, issues such as the uh, Uyghur issues and things like that to actually attack China on its moral stance, especially when it comes to something supposed to be as universal as human rights is concerned. But yes. when it comes to the Chinese and understanding of um, life in itself, it has a very deep Taoist history in that sense. Yep. And how they view life also can be contextually very different to how other people actually view the issue. Absolutely. Of Exactly. So the question then becomes is how will then they actually get to play that power out? But it becomes that. It becomes not so much of um, 
understanding and bringing understanding of just what is a, uh, in a sense, a shared value of what life is supposed to be like. But at the same time, um, it becomes the issue of projecting one's power and one's authority and protecting one's own sovereignty in that sense. So I'm using the Chinese example in this particular scenario because um, one could argue they see the world a little bit differently from the rest of us. No, absolutely. And I, and I think it's a, it's, a, it's a very useful and it's a very good example. But if you don't mind, I'd like to just go back a bit to some of the points you raised about, um, and, 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 and this may come across as somewhat, um, somewhat depressing in some ways, because I, as a historian, you cannot help but think, and when you see uh, uh, the processes of development over time, you find it difficult to deny the role played by power mm -hmm. yep. in determining what the good should be, how we understand the world in which we live in, you know, the very, the very foundation, not just, not just in terms of the politics of it, also, but also in terms of the very foundations of what we understand to be knowledge. Mm -hmm. Perhaps more importantly, knowledge that can be accepted and knowledge that can be considered legitimate. Mm -hmm. Now, knowledge is so fundamentally important because as you pointed out in your question, what we understand to be true or false underwrites a great deal of our understanding of right and wrong. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yes, and and this is this is architecture that draws mm -hmm. from a very very powerful civil. Uh, to go back to use the same word as you've done, and I and I and I, I don't know whether I'm using it in the same way, but I would also call it a civilizational impulse. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. And then. The when it comes to that question, actually, because right now, when we discuss those matters as well, especially as civilizational impulses, civilizational contextual uh, projection, mm -hmm. but there's another element that has risen recently as well within the last few decades, actually, which is social media. Because yep. we talk about, even when we talk about things like projecting our own sense of what is right and wrong into the international stage, calling for justice, calling for, but even then the concept of justice itself can in itself be highly civilizationally contextual. What is just to you may not be just to others. But yes. when it comes to things like, for example, um, the way the world is starting to engage with each other uh, through things like social media, when young people essentially or even uh, not just young people anyone who has access to the to the world wide web begin to clash with these ideas and then you start seeing uh, supposed to be new forms of negotiations so negotiating with and compromising on how they understand their values and their ethics that is true but at the same time what you also see from social media unfortunately i'm a bit of a cynic when it comes to social media in this sense is that it's also taught a lot of people how to form their own social bubbles and social circles yes. where they separated each other and then became their own you know echo chambers essentially yes. so in that sense it actually brings again to the question of what is then the future of how we're going to negotiate the question of a global ethic and how we're going to deal with each other <laughs> in what do you think well, of I, I i suspect the short answer for that would be with difficulty uh, <laughs> um uh, you know, I, um, I you know, I, I take your point about the role of social media actually quite seriously, and and I too, I share your concerns, and I am a bit of a skeptic myself, and um, and I and not not only in terms of what you describe, which and what you describe very well in terms of those social bubbles, but also in terms of a simple thing called language. Mm, yeah. For example, you know, one of the things that we've come to realize is that. People who, someone like me, for instance, I'm merely conversant in two languages which I, I use fairly frequently. Yeah. And out of those two, I, I tend to gravitate towards looking at uh, things being written or being said in English. And that, that in itself, it, 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 it's already limiting. And it, it disallows me from seeing much of the discourse that's out there that's being done in other languages, in other cultures, in other contexts. Yeah. Which provide, which can be, which we can can create a a, a, a slightly tunneled vision of what's actually hap happening out there for me. Mm. I tend to find, um, and I, and I, you know, one of the things, well, lessons I've learned is, is to try and remind myself that perhaps, you know, I, um, I I I shouldn't be misled into thinking the material that I've encountered primarily in English 
and primarily within a in a westernized context uh, it, it reflects the richness of the kind of discussions taking place on social media, which is not to say intrinsically those discussions are, are of any value because as you rightly said, even when I reflect upon the, and I have to say, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not the most social media savvy individual in the world. Even whatever little that I've been exposed to, uh, I, I tend to find it's just not what is being discussed, but, other, but many other questions like the mode of discussion, how it's being discussed, uh, the actual the limitations of the medium itself, yep. um, you know, plays a role in 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 shaping what kind of discussions can take place. Yep. You you have in a sense to me anyway a number of different challenges. You you have the medium itself, which presents a challenge, mm -hmm. and, and not only that, but you also have to negotiate the kind of. Uh, the kind of and, 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 I, and I hate to sound banal about this, but more often than not, in social media, it's always the loudest voices, and then it almost like a it becomes a popularity contest in a way. No, that's true. And then one of the one of the worrying things about any kind of popularity contest is that um, you know we we end up celebrating and and no offense to people who like Britney Spears or or Shawn Mendes, yeah. but we tend to celebrate music of that sort rather than Beethoven because you know the, the levels of appeal is different. And, um, and one of the things that I, and, and you know, the, the, these truncated forms sometimes presents all sorts of challenges in themselves. And mm. it's to have an intelligent discussion yeah. because you know, name calling and sometimes, um, and baiting mm. is more pervasive and, and, and is a more effective way of getting uh, support and public involvement. No, I agree completely with that because um just to put it on a slightly more serious note above Britney Spears and uh, <laughs> uh, but it's actually more of what because we um, and I'll be mentioning this again at the end of the video but uh, we'll also be participating just as an organization together with a few others we'll be participating with uh, on the on a webinar called Christian Zionism but right. we'll talk about the topic of Christian Zionism, for example, about religiosity. We're moving from uh, Britney Spears to religiosity, very different tonal shift on here. Not really. <laughs> yeah, perspective, yes, that's true. <laughs> there's, a, there's a loyal following on, on both sides, my friend. Yeah, especially for football and things, and even popular culture items like this. But when you talk about the discussions, when you talk about things like, again, even in engaging the discussion, the medium is one problem, but there are certain attitudes that are brought, like we mentioned like, uh, just now about the certain ways of Eurocentricism and how it actually uh, informs certain people of how they perceive and participate in discussion. So, um, for example, we have issues where we want to try to engage. There is groups that actively do try to engage on this matter when it comes to things like interfaith, for example. Yes. But either that topic or the discussion itself gets immediately hijacked by those who do not want to have a discussion. So they yes. immediately start doing either antagonizations or they do callings. Or, yeah. or, or at the most banal level of it, I've seen some who just pretty much walk away from the discussion because um, they use concept, they use the idea of if you don't understand, you won't, under, you will never understand what I'm uh, feeling about this because you've never lived it. But in that, in itself, pretty much kills off any discussion or any chance of understanding it. So it becomes that sort of thing where we just fall back towards our contextual bubbles and just remove ourselves from discussion. So that's also another challenge to me about how we can actually see any form of shared uh, shared values coming through because we're not sharing in the first place as well and we just keep on falling back to it yes now let, let me just let me just you know i've 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 um i've had some excursion down those particular paths you're talking about and um and one of the things that um and i and i and i and i and i and i share your concerns and and it is a real concern on the other hand um i've also had occasion to see um, folks from across the religious spectrum doing precisely what you described. They decide to either not participate, remain silent, or leave it altogether, or to 
indulge in the most um, banal form of of behavior, you know, to accuse, to be ultra defensive, to close one's ears to any kind of uh, response from people whom, for whatever reasons, you may find uh, disagreeable. The key is Hasanal. Um, but on the other, but 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 having said that, I, I also want to point out that there are some some there are uh, experiences that I've had in the dialogue, perhaps not here, but in other parts, whereby you know people who want to engage are themselves being pushed back. Mm -hmm. The kinds of engagement they want to bring to the table. Um, does not seem to root to suit uh, the rules, the, the set of rules that everyone seems to be agreed upon mm. when they do meet. Mm. Uh, I on, and, and that on a, on a practical level, that's what I've seen on an experiential level. However, um, on a theoretical level, there are also some. There are you know, as as I'm sure you know as much as I do, that there are also equally difficult problems to deal with. Mm -hmm. Now, when we talk about getting, for example, different religious groups to agree to an inter-religious dialogue, and I put inverted commas, it is that in itself is not so straightforward because what uh, because what religion itself, as you know, is is a very it's often seen as a very loaded term, uh, yeah. and, and, it, and it has its own history and its 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 own it, its own. Uh, um, history of prejudice uh, fused within uh, the whole idea of religion in itself, and um, and and one of the things sometimes that you tend to find is, and and I've met very serious uh, people involved in religious dialogue who gets turned off by wanting to engage with some of these groups because they they tend tend to find that the desire to find to find uh, common ground. Mm obviates the need to discuss the problems associated with it. No, I agree. So that, uh, you know, that the desire to avoid friction and tension, which um, perhaps, you know, some people might find that um, agreeable. I, on the other find find that reality is extremely messy. Yeah. And the ways in which we can have a, a useful dialogue is to recognize that messiness of what it is. Yeah. And, and, and that there are these differences in store. Hmm. Examples, though, I have to say, which I, I, I found quite useful, and, and, and it's, it's not necessarily useful uh, in, all, in, in, in all the contexts in which it has been practiced, but certainly um, my engagement with it, both in the United States and in England, um, I, I found it quite useful, was um, looking at something called um, um, uh, scriptural reasoning. Mm -hmm. Scriptural reasoning. I mean, it's albeit it's it's quite limited because it tends to involve only Muslim, Christians, and Jews. Yeah. One of the things which I one aspect of it. I mean, it has its problems, but one aspect which I do find appealing was the fact that you begin on the note that you're going to have differences. Mm -hmm. Yep. And you're not looking at universalizable values or universalizable philosophy, but mm -hmm. you're looking at mutual values or shared values. Yep that we have things that we're concerned about which may not be derived from the same principles mm -hmm. but nevertheless um, are something which can help overcome some of the some of the challenges facing human human society as a whole you know cruelty hunger uh, the lack of respect for human rights and so mm -hmm. on and so forth but rather than, and trying to find a a, a, a a common ideological platform. Yeah. You draw from your own traditions what your own traditions tell you about how you should treat other people mm -hmm. and owe them and what responsibilities you have to society, what responsibilities you have to yourselves. Mm -hmm. And that in that sense, you negotiate the kind of theological barriers that you may encounter when you begin to engage in interreligious dialogues because there are quite a number. Yeah. So in that sense also, I agree because um, at the end of the day, it's also like how we did the uh, Buddhist Muslim forums as well. And uh, with uh, International Network of Engaged Buddhists along with a few yes. other groups. Yeah. Because at the end of the day, we do, may not have 
a sense of the similar approach or a similar weightage in value and how we approach these issues. But we can try to find a way to find a pathway to reach a common set of goals, which is the recognition of certain things like human rights, human uh, yes, yes, very much so. Uh, in that case, also um, the other concerning part of this thing is that while we try to find similar pathways, it is still those differences at the end of the day that becomes not just really a cause of friction, but also a point of exploitation when it mm. comes to certain groups who are pushing a certain agenda. Yes. Um, I may actually point fingers at certain uh, Zionist groups, dominions, yes. things like that as well, who actually try to espouse a what they call a universal. It's because the, the danger of the term of universalism in mm. this case over here is that it becomes a weaponized term to actually... Oh, very much so. Yeah, exactly, because they use these terms to push forward certain ideologies and push forward certain agendas in order to meet, uh, what do you call it, uh, their own uh, vision of how uh, certain uh, certain things should work and the, the, the power itself, that ball should be in their courtyard for that semester because it's the only way they can advance it. But that becomes the point of where uh, our differences our moral differences, the things that we don't talk about, the things that we don't acknowledge, even begin to acknowledge that we are uncomfortable about, that becomes a point of exploitation. And then when they start using it, they start putting things together, when they, whether it be religious, ethnic, or you know cultural. These are the things that they start using all over. And we mentioned it previously as well. At the end of the day, when those things do happen, when those frictions do happen, we do not have that basis to actually talk about finding common uh, common goal through different methods, different paths leading to essentially like, you know, whether the same spiritual understanding, the same uh, moral understanding. But it becomes then after that, in, in especially in the online realm, and to an extent as well in our parliaments, in our actual politics, it becomes on who actually has the biggest voice, who has yeah. the loudest voice, who can insult the other the most. And um, when it comes to geopolitics, uh, it becomes on who has the biggest guns, essentially. So that, that's the very- Or the most money. Or the most money, yeah. Who can buy out the others, who can put pressure on the others. It's what, yes. uh, to an extent, actually, I'm not sure if you heard, but that's kind of what has happening with um, the Palestinian uh, group in Pakistan, who are being pressured right now to actually recognize the state of Israel. And they, I believe it's all done through the auspices, of course, of these uh, Saudi paymasters who essentially have financial leverage on these things. And this is how the geopolitical game is played. Because especially on the Palestinian issue, so we, we talk and discuss a lot about the moral right of the Palestinian cause, the recognition of their position on the matter. But yes. at the end of the day, when it comes to geopolitics and under, understanding of moral, it seems like most of the time it just becomes money wins out or you know force essentially power wins out on this one. And that's the I, you know, yeah. I, I you know I, sorry. Yeah, yeah, I, it's, uh, it's it's just that I you know I I, I whenever. Palestine is raised, I, I, I get somewhat despair, to be honest. <laughs> it, uh, it, it's, a, it's an extremely uh, troubling, um, it, it brings a, a whole baggage of very troubling memories and histories all bundled up into one. Um, and I, I, I worry because as, as you rightly point out, um, the case of Palestinian is actually a wonderful example of what you mean, of I think what we're concerned about, mm. is that um, you 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 turn. You see, the to me the Palestinian issue has 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 several interconnected but quite different aspects to it. about the struggle in itself, mm -hmm. it's of course, that powerful Islamic impulse in this whole thing as well. It's a, it's, it's a very Muslim thing. I mean, though some people have tried to. To try to to, to uh, reduce it essentially to a political struggle or to see it in secular terms, mm -hmm. by, and 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 that in itself is already poses a number of different challenges for for someone like me who's a Muslim. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm committed to my faith, um, and I and I think I think you it's it's very difficult to uh, separate, you know, the experience of life between a, both an intellectual and experiential sense between. You know your your faith and and say your ideology, so to speak, or, or the way that you look at politics, or you look at the way you look at 
social relations. And the point that I raise about this is, is important because uh, I have I know people in, Amer in in the U.S., for example, who are very, 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 very sympathetic to this Palestinian issue. Mm -hmm. They work a great. They do put in a lot of effort to 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 fight for to to fight for the security and independence of the Palestinian state. But some of them, ironically, have found the idea of Islam quite anathema. Mm -hmm. they, they don't find it appealing at all. Mm -hmm. It's to them. I mean, it's it, it, it's what we need to do is to secure the sovereignty of different different states, essentially as a uh, as a as a as a result of understanding international relations in a certain way, out of respect for the notion of a particular set of, a partic particular notion of sovereignty, for instance, mm -hmm. that that each independent nation should have. But this in itself. Um, can also raise the hackles of some Palestinian Muslims I know from mm. around the world, which is, you know, it's 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 almost an, an, a subtle shift to try and divide between, the, in in terms of understanding what it means to be Palestinian from mm. being Palestinian and having Islam as an intrinsic part of that identity. Mm. Now, I'm not saying they're necessarily right, or I'm saying they're necessarily wrong. I'm merely pointing out that that these factors play a role mm -hmm. shifting and dynamic at the same time in looking at, in, in trying to extrapolate a better understanding of some of these issues, which is critical if we want to try and begin to address it in mm -hmm. a respectful, proper way. We have to be comprehensive, yep. we have to be too selective. And selectiveness is also the fault of a lot of the narratives that have come across. It's very mm -hmm. practical. You know, we need a practical solution for a practical problem. Mm -hmm, yeah. I tend to find that when you try to simplify these things a little bit too much, yeah, sure. basis, it opens the door. And I, I'm not questioning some of the niyat or some of the intentions of some of the people, which may be very, 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 very straightforward. But mm -hmm. it does open the door for some of these other things to come in, things that we've described, these, these elements of insidiousness, which seeks to um, ameliorate, yeah. uh, you know, um, the nature of any given society because they have other agendas. Because they're smart, they're not stupid. They understand yeah. how the game is played. Because as you really put, it's 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 about um, what was the word that you use about um, about certain words? Um, universal. You use a, a wonderful um, word just now to describe it. It's um, it's weaponized. Yeah. Yeah. And the way in which words are weaponized in this discourse is equally mm -hmm. critical. If at the end of the day, the whole idea of human dignity and rights are to be mm -hmm. to be secure, yeah, and the representation thereof, or when it comes to uh, understanding that what the issue represents, you want to get as many support as possible, but at the same time, in also getting many uh, trying to attend to get all that support for the Palestinian issue also reduces certain elements of the discussions that actually come from the Palestinian issue and the narrative and the discourse of it, it just boils it down to something that, you know, I, because in the uh, whole context of Christian Zionism, we're talking about Christian Zionism, the Christian values that are being pushed forward within a framework of a dominionist ideology. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, when it comes to also when... Uh, we overly emphasize on the Islamic point and then it removes the Christian. There's a lot of balancing acts when it comes to actually trying to push forward this thing and trying to find. But the common sense, in this case, I think it summarizes about what we were talking about in this sense, where we're trying to find a common goal, which is, you know, to uh, elevate the rights and the uh, to promote justice for the Palestinian people. Yeah, absolutely. We just go about it sometimes. We muddled it up so much but at the same time it is a mess it is a complex issue because of its contextual background it's important of the palestine to the abrahamic faith for example just using it from a theological perspective not necessarily a geopolitical one so we're looking at that thing and then we try to instead of address the complexity we try to reduce it and say that it's not a muslim issue it's not a christian issue it's not a jewish issue it's about human but then it becomes the fact of that you know some people don't feel like this is actually a true issue to actually uh, 
get on board because we need to play to certain sentimentalities, I suppose. Uh, just being cynical for a moment over here. When it comes to playing on sentimentalities and getting people on the side because of theological discussions over here. So we use theology to get them on the bandwagon, but then after that, they start fighting in the wagon. So, so that becomes a problem. No, I mean, you know, it's, 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 I find, you know, I, 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 you know, on a personal level, I'm extremely sympathetic to that point of view, though I understand why it, 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 it can be, it, it does present its own set of challenges and problems. And, um, and I, uh, you know, I, I think the, the point you're trying to make is, 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 is part of the tension that we find ourselves in. Hmm. This is this is the challenge, really. Yep. That balance, you know, yep. the degree to which um, we have enough folk out there that can push an agenda, which 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 attempts to be. Because you, bear in mind, you you could never be truly just. Mm. That, that 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 that's uh, you know. But but again, and to use that old adage, you know, you shouldn't allow uh, the perfect to be the enemy of the good. So. Yep. So perhaps in, in this regard, it, it might be useful to, to have some measure of humility on some mm -hmm. of the part of the participants to understand that, you know, there are, you know, there, are, there are different gradations of values, there are different kinds of values in each and every one of our own traditions. And yet there are these key issues which are being played out in front of our eyes right now. Mm -hmm. That means we need to prioritize and we need to identify and see that certain things that needs to be done because otherwise the situation becomes even more dire. Yeah. Uh, would that then therefore that that's my personal view, but but would then therefore that nullify the differences of views and opinions that you will encounter as you go along? Probably not, because mm -hmm. even then you still fall into the into this difficult situation where you have to define what you mean and what you say in. Mm -hmm clearer terms so that you can justify an action being taken on the basis of them. Hmm. Sometimes, I, but, but it's a sort of frustrating thing because sometimes you can feel as if you're going in circles and roundabouts. Yeah, yeah and, um, and you're, you don't seem to be getting anywhere. Hmm. Again, and it, you know, I, I understand that and I too wish to get off that. The merry-go-round. <laughs> the merry-go-round. But having said that, sometimes when the temptation is too strong, allows these elements which can be extremely negative to find a back door a back uh, a back door into mm. jacking some of these political projects yeah. is there a way of dealing with it I, I tend to find that the only, the best thing one perhaps can do is to be not to try and avoid being too complacent about it to pay attention to see what's going on as you as you go along and you mm. participate in these uh, in these initiatives. And I think, I think I, I hate to sound as if it's, it's not much to go on, but I think that's about as far as, as we can go. Mm, yep. Yeah, and, um, and but, but having said that, I, I don't think that's entirely a bad thing. I think, I think um, you know, we, we all want to make very big, to take very big steps, but sometimes it's the little steps over time that counts. Yeah, that's Maybe true. Be more prudent. Yeah, yeah. I agree. I think that's also a good note actually to end on because I just realized we went over the time a little bit. But um, no, I also agree that at the end of the day, I think uh, when it comes to our discussion on geopolitical morality, especially with using the Palestinian issue as a good example and understanding how civilizations work on negotiating this uh, vast cultural moral differences as well. I think it, at the end of the day, we do need to take it a little bit uh, not to say slow, but to be vigilant and to constantly uh, observe on how we put our foot into the door and how we put, and we how we negotiate each step of the way. But at the same time, I also do agree that yes, we also need to really focus on even also having the discussions in the first place as well, and yes. maybe also deal with the uh, uncomfortability of um, understanding and reviewing our yes. sense of morality. So yeah. Well, thank you so much. I mean, it's, it's been a lovely discussion and I'm sure we could go on and on. And, and um, there are many, but many things to discuss. Time, because this is something that's obviously also very much best and also very um, temporal because yep. we'll see what happens in the future, especially with uh, things that are going on this year right now. Oh, so, goodness. 
So, okay, so thank you very much, Calden, for joining thank me Thank you so much for having me. And um, yes, it's, it's always wonderful to speak to you. All right, thank you very much, Calden. And we'll take see you around next time, all right? All right, lovely, take care. Thank take care, you too. Right, bye. bye. And on that note as well, I would also like to do one final housekeeping and announcement uh, where uh, for the International Movement for a Just World, um, we will be having our webinar called Christian Zionism, a threat to uh, Muslim, uh, sorry, a threat to Christian Muslim relations coming up on the 9th December. For more information, you can check the link down below and for, to register and find out more about the event itself. So in that case, um, I think that's it. So once more again, uh, thank you, Calden, and um, we'll see you next time, all right? All right, Bye. take care. All the best. Bye. Guess, and I'll see you.